G'day, we're up here in the Victorian high country. We've been trying to get here all year. I mean, first it was those massive bushfires that wiped most of the place out. Then it was record snowfalls. This is truly a place where Mother Nature rules. Make no mistake about that. And this time, we're going to show you a few of the lesser known tracks. We've got some of the local guys along, the, the experts to show us some of the lesser known tracks. It's amazing, and it's just amazing country. And, and I guess the, the wildest thing about it is that on a good day, you're only an hour and a half, couple of hours out of Melbourne. Talking about good days, I don't know what's happening here, but I think there's a blizzard coming on. So I think we'd better go and look at some of these tracks. The Victorian high country is only an hour and a half from the city of Melbourne and we travel through some of the country's best alpine regions right there just on the outskirts of town. We visited towns like Marysville, Jamison, Woods Point and finished our trip in Walhalla. Don't ask me where we were in between. River crossings, mud, snow, whatever looked tricky, that was us. And here we are in the town of Maryvale just passing through. I don't know what it is about these Victorian towns but they're beautiful little places. Plenty of history and uh, lots of places where you can buy a jumper and a beanie and a pair of gloves and trust me you're going to need them all. We had four vehicles making this trip into the high country. Up front of this uh, convoy Al Johnson's mighty 78 series with the ute back. Al bought the cab chassis and brought the ute back over from uh, South Africa and He's gone to an awful lot of trouble to make this ute look reasonably standard because it's certainly not underneath. Also along on the trip was Terry Smith with his uh, new four-door JK Jeep. Now this is one we've all been waiting to have a look at. Being Terry, being Mr Smooth as he is, of course he's already lifted it 50 mil and uh, done some wonderful things with the suspension. The Hummer's the only vehicle here that hasn't had a lift. <laughs> you think I was worried? Not as much as the people at GMH who lent it to me, I can tell you. I don't know if Editor Glenn actually mentioned to them that we were taking it off-road. During the early stages of the trip, I mean, here we are, we're only an hour and a half out of Melbourne, up in this beautiful alpine country, it really is unbelievable. The first thing I noticed looking around was that everything looked flat. I'm used to flat stuff, you know, Simpson Desert, stuff like that. But by crikey, the bushes and things around here, they all look flat. And it's because, Al told me over the radio, they'd had about five or six feet of snow here the week before. That's why everything's so soggy and wet and the bushes and grass was flattened out by the snow. It wasn't long before we were on Frenchman's track and having a bit of a look around. These high country tracks, they can look quite easy and be that slippery it's not funny, especially for a bloke with standard tyres. About now I'm working out the buttons on the dash on the Hummer though and I've realised that it's got a locking rear diff. This was to prove probably the one major advantage the one thing that really made that H3 perform better than I ever expected it would. There's not much on Al's ute that's standard, that's for sure. From the Detronic powered motor, you know, chipped up motor all the way through. He has worked this thing over like you wouldn't believe. The winch has been upgraded with a bigger motor. 
Oh, even the lighting loom's been upgraded. It's got fridges, chainsaws, the works burger, and the suspension is awesome too. Just before this first river crossing, I took a bit of time out to look for the air intake on the hammer, having sunk a couple of jeeps in the past and a few other vehicles too. And you know what? Very sensibly, it's up underneath one of those funny bump pods at the back of the bonnet. The Hummer actually has the highest standard air intake this side of anything with a snorkel. Nothing like that's going to worry the Jeep, of course. The 60 series is the 12 HT factory turbo diesel. Owl's had this truck for a long time, he's modified it, done all sorts of things to it. And on this trip, he got uh, Neil Barkway to drive it. Now, if there's a couple of quiet achievers on this trip, it's Neil and the 60, because wherever we went, the 60 was there too. Al, I know a lot of people out there are going to see this truck in action and know that it's been tweaked just about everywhere. I mean, it's got power to burn, it's got suspension, it's got everything. But one of the things that I think people are really going to notice is the fact that this winch works like nothing on earth. What have you done to it? Quite a few things, Ruthie. Mechanically and electrically, she's been upgraded. Electrically, we've got more battery power. We've got a contact to pack instead of a solenoid pack. A contact to pack gives you more amperage to the motor. Okay. And very importantly, a bigger, higher horsepower, more powerful motor. What sort of horsepower difference are we talking about? We're talking a massive difference. We're talking close to 11 horsepower out of this motor, which oh. is awesome. And what's the standard? About winch? six. About six? Yeah. So it's you've nearly doubled nearly the horsepower doubled to start yeah. with. This truck, I know, you've built it up as pretty much your perfect Toyota, haven't you? you it's, know? It's, it's my dream truck. It is your dream truck, and it's sort of built with a no expense spared attitude, is it? Well, pr agree? pretty much we bought it brand new, and we, we pulled it to pieces, and we built it as we wanted it to be, which is the ideal way to do it. Also, I noticed that the other Piranha truck on the trip, the one Neil's been driving, I've been watching the way you look at that too. That's a bit of a family favourite, isn't it? I love that truck. I'm more passionate about that truck than this thing because that's, <laughs> that's been with us a long time. Yeah. That's an under $10,000 toy and that can do almost everything. But the thing that made that truck so magic is it's got a 12 HT Toyota diesel motor. Yes. One yes. of the best diesels ever built. It is fantastic. It is. A set of diff locks, some decent tyres, a little bit of cheap tweaking and it's fun. Yeah, it's a hell of a lot of fun. It's I mean, fun. Neil's been going everywhere we've gone and then some and making it look really easy all week. So. And you're not playing with sheep stations. No, you're not. You're not at all. I guess that's the bit that really intrigues me, the fact that, you know, Al can build his dream truck, spare no expense sort of thing. I mean, even so, you've done really well. It's not that expensive, but on the other end of the scale, you know, somewhere down towards the Milo end of the scale, yes. you've got all that enjoyment for less than 10 grand. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Before long we're into the tricky stuff and it's starting to get a bit dark. This particular track, whoa, I don't know what it was called. I think the Victorians called it a shortcut. They were shortcuts. But when I saw Al's ute working that hard, I thought, oh no, oh no, I'll never get the Hummer up there. Sure enough, it wasn't long before Al got stuck and this thing's got everything. With the sun going down, it's never a good time to start a whole bunch of recoveries. But let's face it, what option have you got? Now we know why Al brought his son along. He can run. If you're thinking the uh, winch on Al's ute is uh, winding it up fairly quickly, that's because it is. It's an 8,000 pounder, but it's been severely modified. It really has. If there was a winch that could pluck a truck off a cliff in a big hurry, this is the one. Contact the pack instead of the standard solenoids, the drum's got big fat support bearings, and the whole thing's powered by a souped up electric motor that delivers about twice the horsepower. Hal's running rope instead of cable too. <laughs> I'll tell you what, more and more people are in the know about rope. Especially in really stressful situations like this, when the whole vehicle's hanging off it. Rope is just that much safer.
Al's got three Exide Orbital batteries under the bonnet there, overseen by one of his uh, Piranha management systems, and he needed all of it, he really did, for this hot rod winch. Especially when at the end of the day you've got to keep the fridge running too. It was starting to get dark and Al's only just got to the top. The rest of the rest of us decided the quickest way out of here might be to drop back and go back the other way. Late that night we got to the Gap Resort, a homemade pub right on top of a hill. I tell you what, the hospitality is superb, it really is. Next morning, there we were, nice and warm in heated dongers down near the pub, and outside it was freezing. Snow built up against the doors and a mist that meant you couldn't even see the hills. We stopped and had breakfast because it was just too good, it really was. There's one thing about Victorian high country, you know, if you went there in a winter trip, you wouldn't really think about camping, you know. I mean, you might think about camping, but, ooh, boy, you should have heard the winds howling during the night. All's good, though. All's exciting, because we're looking forward to a really full day of some mucky tracks today, I can tell you. With Al leading the way, it wasn't long before we were off and looking for another shortcut somewhere. Now I'd like to tell you all the tracks we travelled, but to be honest, I couldn't remember the names in a pink fit. Couldn't see any of the signs, the bushfires had burnt most of them out. And the ones they hadn't burnt out had been knocked over by snow. The boys kept telling me, oh this is blah blah track, but this is the shortcut. Yeah right. This gap between the trees, we actually cut this out the night before just getting into the Gap Resort. That's one thing about the high country. If you're going to travel it seriously and expect to get to the end, you'd better be carrying a chainsaw. It was no surprise to me that Al, who's, you know, a real high country bloke, he's got it in his blood, he was carrying three chainsaws, and you know what? He quite often used two of them. Second one to get the first one unstuck. Big solid trees, but after a big storm and with the ground as wet as it was, they fall over and that's it, we're not going anywhere. You know, there's the Hummer with its standard slippery tyres but it's just managing to get through no matter anyway. And that's because we've got the pressures down. I had them right down at that stage to about 14 pounds. And because of that locking in diff. It hasn't got a very big uh, fuel tank though. It wasn't long before we needed to top it up. Mind you, you know, as uh, most experienced off-roaders know, the sooner you can get your spare fuel out of the jerry can and into the tank, the better. The last thing you need hanging around on the back of a tray back is a fuel drum, or anywhere else for that matter. Get it into the tank, it's safer in there. You wouldn't think you could be a couple of hours out of Melbourne and a long way from a garage. <laughs> There's a lot of things you wouldn't think about the high country. Here it is on day two, and we've already found a super serious downhill slippery piece of track. I guess it's another shortcut. <laughs> Everything we took that looked a bit gnarly was a shortcut. Al being up front got to try it out first, and by crikey, this was the descent from hell, it really was. I was glad to see him go down first though. I mean, he's got, the, he's got superb driving skills and a great vehicle, but at least I knew where to put the Hummer. This was quite exciting in the Hummer. No decent tyres to talk of and no clearance. You know what saved it? The rear diff lock. I had the rear diff lock in, I had it down in low range, and it just pulled itself nice and straight and slid down the hill. Look at the way the mud's packed up on those tyres. Oh, I'd die for a decent set of tyres in this country, you really would. Of course, Mr Smooth had uh, Coopers on the Jeep. 
Look at him go. No problems at all. Terry really is one of the, the best off-road drivers I've ever seen in action. But Neil was sticking that 60 everywhere too and he had no dramas at all. We were moving around all over the place. This is the sort of country where panel damage is it's just one little slip away, isn't it? We just pulled in up uh, a big river here, just on the edge of the road to have a bit of lunch. And um, no big surprise to run into Dennis Dwyer, because he's up here just about seven days a week, what with the Land Rover Owners Club and the land care plan that they do. And um, I think you put in another half hour or so with Exide Batteries, don't you, from time to time? Yeah, I bet every second week, mate. Yeah, <laughs> it gets a bit hard. But bottom line is Dennis is one of the experts on batteries in Australia, without a doubt. And so I had to ask him a few questions. I've always had problems with batteries up here in the high country. And it's kind of, I'm very keen to know what an expert actually runs in his truck. So, I mean, what do you use? Ruthie, I use the, uh, the latest technology batteries, they're the orbital batteries, they're the AGM, yep. uh, spiral wound, totally sealed batteries, and they deliver a high capacity of energy very, very quickly. And just to be sure, and because I can, I've got two in there for starting. So we've got a couple of storage batteries also located in the rear of the vehicle, yep. and they're for your inverters and the refrigerator and lighting and uh, this sort of thing, which we've got today. Yeah, so you use... AGMs for that too, you don't use deep cycle? I do use AGM, they're a special hybrid battery which is a deep cycle cross uh, starting Starter battery, battery. Yeah. and uh, they do perform the job beautifully, they're totally sealed as opposed to a lot of batteries these days, they say they're maintenance free but they're not really sealed. These are absolutely sealed, uh, sitting in the back of the vehicle uh, in a proper aired area, yeah. and vented to the outside. Yeah. So uh, all set up there for a, uh, a really good reliable run. So the problem here is in the old days, you know, if your batteries ran down to sort of 10 or 9 volts or something, you could still get the thing going. But these days with computerised cars, there's a baseline. There's 10 and a half, 11 volts, whatever it is, something like that. Would that's, that be right? That's right, yeah. Ruthie. The modern motor car yeah. now has a critical voltage it's got to meet. If it hasn't got that sort of volts, there's nothing you can do. You know, buckets of hot water, all the rest of the old tricks, they just don't do anything. So really, as you can see from Dennis, the only way to do it is to make sure you've got something in reserve and you've got good batteries to start with. Um, that must make your Land Rover reliable, does it? This makes my Land Rover a very reliable starting vehicle. <laughs> and don't have a fun like that. <laughs> oh, come on, this is the first <laughs> chance we've ever had to say Land Rover and reliable in the same sentence. <laughs> Thanks, well Dennis. done, Ruthie. <laughs> good on you, mate. Thank you. Shortly after we'd uh, run into Dennis, we took on one of the nastiest downhill drops I've ever seen. Now, Al had already made it down, and he was down there with uh, Neil and Terry calling the shots, but I had to get the Hummer down, and by crikey, look at that. It was just slide all the way. There's no uh, real technique involved in this. Follow the wheel ruts left by the big 78. Then it was Terry's turn and by that stage, I'd really trashed the track. Look at him go. This truck's almost brand new and I reckon Terry must have been sweating on the paint. There's times when off-roading, it's about the most exciting thing on earth, and by crikey, this was one of them. There's no doubt that Al Johnson's 78 series was, you know, the big vehicle on this trip. It looks standard, but by crikey, it's not. Not by a long way. It's an awesome vehicle, and it's built to tackle this sort of country. But you know, here's me, dead stock Hummer, putting it through much the same tracks. Nothing to do with me, this Hummer was getting better and better and better. The more I got used to it, the more I realised that it's really quite a capable machine. Mind you, there's a limit to how far you can go with standard rubber, isn't there? I found it a few times on this trip. But, you know, a little bit of momentum, roll back for another go. And as long as you don't hit the trees, you're right. Well, almost right. I would have been right. Yeah, there's a shackle. Fortunately, Wazza was there to uh, help with the recovery. Are you happy with that? Yep. Okay. Um, I'll get Aaron on the radio to call any dramas, eh? 
There's no mucking around with those big recovery hooks on the front of the Hummer, is there? They're great stuff. Having, you know, got the Hummer well and truly stuck on the same section of track, Mr Smooth just drove the JK straight through. What do you got to do? And then Neil came along in the 60 and just punched it straight through. Ah, go the old Toyotas. They take a hell of a lot of beating, don't they? Quarter of a million Ks on the clock and Al reckons it's only just run in. Oh, wow. How good is this, eh? I mean, day two, we're only an hour and a bit out of Melbourne. This is unbelievable. These Victorians are crazy. they got this right on their doorsteps. We've got nothing like this in Queensland, mostly because it wouldn't be snowing. Tomorrow, we're going to see snow. They've promised me. Oh, I can't wait. It's fantastic. I'm not sure what track this is. Possibly it's the back of Mount Terrible. It might be Corn Hill. It could be Pluto. I'm not really sure. Someone might recognise it by the old wrecks along the way. I'm surprised there weren't a lot more old wrecks, to be honest. And I'm not talking about the one in the Hummer, either. Every now and then in the high country, you pop out of those big, beautiful gum trees and into a bit of a cleared spot where you get a view. And that's where you realise how awesome this country is. It just goes for miles and miles. You can see snow-capped ridges in the distance. It's just superb country, it really is. That's not to say it's not cold, though. I think I had about eight pairs of underpants on by now, three pairs of wet weather pants and a couple of other things too. And that was just the bottom half. Late in the day and we're working our way through to the town of Woods Point. That's where we're trying to get to anyway, but the tracks have tightened up. Things have got really close. I think we're on what they call a shortcut again. This is the Gap Resort. Hey, guess what? We got here again. Two nights in a row. And you know why? Because it's too good to miss out on. It was built originally out of bits and pieces from the old mine up here. So I felt right at home, as you can bet. Even when you're under snatch and we were pulling you up, the fact that you were able to hold that because the angle that you had, the fleet angle, really wanted to pull you into those ruts, but just to be able to pull around that tree was perfect. And then, yeah, it was awesome. That was very was lucky. Good driving. Not many people know about the Gap Resort. Was it did. He's the one who found it. He's the one who booked us in up here. By crikey, I'm glad he did too. Everything's all right. Just say goodnight and I'll show myself to the door. Could, could somebody help me down? Next day, and guess what? Plenty of mist, plenty of mud, plenty of wet tracks. And straight away, the boys have found another shortcut. Today, they've promised me we're going to see Woods Point, and we're going to see some snow along the way, too. Well, I don't know, but I reckon it was just about snowing inside the car it was that cold. You know what? I didn't find the seat warmer in the Hummer until day four. Good grief. If I'd have known about that, I would have only had seven pairs of undies on. Leaving the resort, you know, I kept thinking, wow, we found this great place here in the high country. Really warm, great meals, great drinks, really good company. But hey, that's the beautiful thing about the high country. You're never that far from a good town, a good pub, or good people. In fact, good people are everywhere here. Get a copy on that, uh, Alan, left of Woods Point. Yeah, past the little huts and they're down left over. Yeah, you can't miss it. There's a sign there, Woods Point 7Ks.
As we ran into Woods Point, I've got to admit, I felt very much at home. It's an old mining town. Welcome to Woods Point. <laughs> that place there, that little cottage, looks just like the one Nick and I used to live in about 30 years ago. This is a beautiful little place, it really is. Woods Point is loaded with history, and here it is, it's still only a couple of hours out of Melbourne, and yet, there's no regular fuel delivery here. The local garage is fueled from 44 gallon drums brought in on a trailer. I think that says a lot about the condition of the roads and the condition of the climate. This has got to be one of the uh, most quaint, for want of a better word, garages in Australia. It's just awesome. Very expensive too. But by crikey, when you need fuel, you'll pay anything for it. And in the high country, you get superb value out of every litre. Neither of the diesels needed fuel, of course. Uh, you know, big tanks and diesel economy. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know, last time I was in the high country, I had water dripping down off the dash. I had wind coming up through the floor. Everything was wet. It was terrible. And here I am sitting in the Hummer. Heated. Leather seats. I didn't know myself, to be honest. Even the wipers worked. It wasn't long before we turned off the main track onto, uh, <laughs> you're never going to believe it, another shortcut. How long he holds in there? No, no but it's rocks. Safe. That's the only thing I'm worried about with the Hummer, the rocks. You have to avoid the rocks because you'll definitely okay. hang up. If you see these some enormous ones and they've been moved, yeah. you know, as I say, out and then up along the bank. Yeah. Make sure you put a bra on, there's no question. Those people with snorkels really don't need to be that concerned. So, Terry and Ruthie, yeah, we'll if you've got bras, yeah. stick them on, it can't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Better be safe than sorry, it's only early in the trip. Yeah. Right. Let's, Let's go. go. We've got lots to go, yeah? yeah. We're we'll going to bra up. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? The concern was, this was the shallower crossing, by the way. Al, this is the Golden River, is it? Absolutely. By crikey, I mean, apart from being freezing cold, there's an awful lot of water there too. It's flowing hard. More water than there was last week, a hell of a lot more, it's come up a long way. Okay, now this is Al's country, he's been through here all the time, um, done a lot of driver training and stuff like that. What, I mean we've stopped here, we've stopped for more than one reason haven't we? Absolutely. Okay, tell us. We've stopped here guys for a couple of reasons, first of all we've all mainly had the headlights on, they get really really hot, you hit this cold water, they crack and break, thing number one. Thing number two, it's been a huge steep downhill. We've been downhill for what do you reckon? Oh, gee, quite a way. Probably 15, 20 minutes or something, yeah, maybe? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The brakes will be hot, really hot. You don't mm. want to dip your red hot brakes into freezing cold water. You can warp and distort the brakes. And it is freezing cold. Let's make no uh, <laughs> My own. Yeah. Diffs. Yeah. The diffs will be hot. They've been working real hard, really hard. If we go through really cold water, that water will want to get sucked inside your diffs, contaminate your diff oil. We're only yep. halfway through the trip. We've got days and days to go. We don't want water in the diff oil buggering up the bearings and stuff. Well, I know all about bearings falling off in the high country. You're Al. an expert on that one. <laughs> I can tell you I've that, seen eh? it before. Yeah, so essentially, I mean, we're letting the trucks cool down. Um, I'm going to be braring up the Hummer. I think Terry will probably do the same to the Jeep. Yep. Uh, not necessary with the Toyota, what do you think? Well, because we've got a snorkel, factory fitted snorkel, yep. we've got diff breathers on it, we've got a viscous coupling on the front. We're pretty right to go through this. Now the water shouldn't come much up above this sort of height here. Yep. And I would say top of the tyres is pretty safe without browing for something like this. Yes, yes. If, it was, if it was above here, I'd be browing up. No questions. Yeah, Absolutely yeah, no questions. Yeah. Perfect. When Al gives you some advice, I'm inclined to take it. I really am. I mean, nobody knows the high country as well as him. Al forged through and showed us the way on the creek, and I'm glad he did too, because uh, that's when I realised that it got that little bit deeper on the other side there, and there was a bit of a dip to the right with some big rocks too. Just the sort of thing that the low-mounted hunter could have got hung up on. 
More than anything, the new Hummer needed the bra. It was the lowest vehicle here. It didn't have a snorkel, although it did have that bonnet mounted air intake. But it had electrical everything under that bonnet. The Hummer just surged straight across. Didn't even notice it. Thanks to the bra, of course. You can tell the, the extra height in Terry's Jeep, you know, that extra 50 mil from cow suspension. It just made all the difference. Not just on the river crossings, but on clearance everywhere too. Mr Smooth was just slipping it over the top of things that, quite frankly, I was scraping over. Go the old Toyota. These rivers are quite fast flowing. Another thing uh, that takes a bit of getting used to here in the whole country is the fact that, you know, that snow's got to melt, hasn't it? It's got to go somewhere. And by crikey, once it hits the rivers, it starts to speed up and it starts to get deep very quickly. And it's quite possible in this country to come back after lunch and have the same river up two or three feet and flowing a hell of a lot faster. You've really got to watch this stuff. It pays to know what you're on about or go with someone who does. The Hummer got strung up shortly after the river crossing when things just got too high in the centre for it. It was sitting up on its uh, bars underneath. It was great having some young blood along on the trip, mostly to do the work of course. If I've got one complaint with the Hummer it's that I had a lot of trouble seeing which way the wheels were pointing. Of course that's not a problem with Milo, I can see the tyres through the holes in the floor. There's river crossings galore in the high country. And they're all awesome, and they're all cold too, especially at this time of year. But the views make everything worthwhile, they really do. Even after the massive bushfires, this is still some of the most fantastic country on earth. It's just breathtaking, it really is. Back, Ruthie! Slow, slow up now! Stop. Al had already set these chains up back at Piranha HQ for the Hummer. So, uh, you know, he showed me how to put them on, how to get them all tensioned up. There's a few tricks to snow chains, and one of them is not to go over 40 kilometres an hour. Well, to be honest, I had it hanging over 45 a couple of times. Didn't seem to make a lot of difference. With snow chains on the rear, the Hummer managed to climb some very steep, slippery, muddy slopes that it wouldn't have had a chance of doing without. I know that because I tried. Now, <laughs> done. Once we'd climbed up a few slopes, we were right into some fair income snow country. And this brought about a whole new change in driving technique. At first, it was just slippery. You know, slippery, muddy, the way you'd expect when you dump 20, 30, 40 gallons of water per square foot on a muddy track. But after a while, the snow got thicker and thicker. And I started to think, hey, I'm not really going anywhere I want to go. I'm just following the tracks. Driving in the snow isn't exactly uh, something us Queenslanders should preach about, is it? But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not that much different to driving on exceptionally slippery clay or uh, possibly black soil, something like that, you know? The whole trick is to sort of keep to the middle of the road, keep to the ruts if they've got any, uh, give yourself plenty of room, take it nice and steady, and do all that and you've got a fair chance of getting through. These chains are making a big difference. Thank heavens for that. One of the problems with this sort of country is that it is so easy to get stuck for a night, or two, or three. All the time we were on top of this hill, and I can't tell you which hell it is, it's probably shortcut hill I'd say. Um, all the time we were there the boys kept saying, ooh gee I hope we don't get a blizzard, or ooh gee I hope the wind doesn't come up. Because that's what can happen in the high country, especially when conditions are like this. 
And one minute you've got a chance of getting out, and the next minute you're stuck there for a few days. It's hard yak at this. We're not going to get through. This will be deep for an hour doing this. We're getting further. Look, we're, how much are we getting each run, do you reckon? A couple of feet? Three feet, maybe? I'm sort of copying a, a crash course here in uh, driving in thick snow and believe me it's different to anything else you've ever done four-wheel driving unless you've done this sort of thing before. Um, not about momentum for a start, momentum's no use at all, in fact momentum's going to chuck you straight off the side. It's all about going really slow and trying to compact the snow underneath your wheels. I'm following in Al's um, footprints as closely as I can because he's already compressed a fair bit of snow. Every now and then it just goes all whoopo and that's it off the side of the road. Um, then the only chance you've got is to try and back and forward and back and forward and compress the snow, turn it into ice underneath the wheels, a little bit of hard packing, off you go again with a bit of luck. Um, wow, it's tricky, it's good fun though, it's terrific. Yep, it sure is terrific. It's terrific when you get stuck too. So much for being a crash hot snow driver, eh? The Hummer's problem, once again, was clearance. That's all. That's all that stopped it. That and the fact that my brain was colder than my bum because I'd found the electric seat warmer by then. Was it me who was telling you how to drive in snow? <laughs> We're stuck. It's not really the sort of place you can pull a snatch either. So we used the winch. Thanks, Terry. Hey, Ruthie, bit of power. Yes, got it. We're on. Time and time again, I realised that in the snow, slow and steady wins the race. Leaving the Hummer just to idle along with the rear diff lock in and the chains on. Riding over everyone else's packed down snow, that was the way to get it through. Every time I gave that throttle a little twitch, it just died. That night, I thought we were going to be stuck for sure. But no, we made it to Jamison. The pub's got beaut meals, it really has, and good rooms. But get this, the night we spent there, they didn't have the hot water service working. So that meant sort of banging the pipes a lot and letting the ice fall out on our heads. A welcome respite though, and I was really happy to see Jamison, I really was, especially at the end of that day. But we moved out because we had this big plan to take some more, guess what, shortcuts across to Valhalla. Now I'm using the Viking pronunciation there, but I noticed the locals call it Walhalla. I don't really know what it is, but it certainly is heaven. The whole high country is beautiful, isn't it? It's just such a great place, it really is. It wasn't long before we were back up in the hills and guess what, more snow. Now not once on this trip did I get to see snow fall. Again guys, snow's looking pretty deep coming up here, we better stop and put the chains on before it gets too deep, thanks. I got to see it blow across the road, I got to see it blow out of the trees, I got to see it dump all over the Hummer but I never actually saw it circle and fall out of the sky. Probably a good thing really, I was having trouble dealing with it just as it was. Aaron Smith proved to be a bit of an expert at putting on chains. I'm glad he did because it means diving underneath the vehicles and hooking them up from behind the wheels. Not what you want to do in the snow. Look at this, it looks like there's another blizzard blowing up. It's freezing out there, you can barely see, and every foot we go further up this hill, the deeper the snow gets. I've got to tell you, there's a few times when I wondered if we'd ever get out of there, but we did. We certainly did, and before long the sun was shining, and everything was back to being hunky-dory.
Now, I know there's an awful lot of people out there, just like me, who've been hanging out to see what the new JK Jeep would be like in the real world, you know. Um, I mean, it's the family man's version of the TJ, and Terry and Aaron have been roaring around in it all week. Um, what's the old man's driving like, Aaron? We'd better start there. The driving's a bit rough, but the vehicle is absolutely awesome. <laughs> oh, I see. Awesome vehicle makes up for the driving. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Terry, what'd you think of it straight out of the box? Well, he's right. <laughs> I mean, standard, they come with, uh, you know, locking diffs front and rear. They come with a detachable sway bar that you can do from the cab again. So, it's fantastic. Off-road, it's just unbelievable where it'll go. They've got, their, they've got their priorities right, haven't they, Jeep? Yep. I mean, yep. locking diffs and disconnectable sway bars, you don't need much more than that. That's and space right. now. <laughs> yeah, plenty of space. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, um, being a Smith vehicle, of course, it lasted a couple of nanoseconds before it got modified. Is that normal around your place, Aaron? That's pretty standard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah max I, it out. Max it out almost straight away. That's yeah. right. I wouldn't really call it a max job, though, Terry. What have you done no, to it? No, no, not a lot. Suspension, uh, bars and a winch. Yeah. Uh, and some stuff on the top to, uh, to hold a bit of storage. Yeah, suspension, bars and a winch. And, of course, this uh, this bar, it's an ARB bar, but it must be a prototype or something, isn't Both it? Both front and rear are prototypes. They're steel, so they're super strong, got yep. all the mounts for high lifts, fantastic. Yeah. But they're not available right now, but not long. And what about the suspension? Where'd you have to go for that? Cal Off-Road. Actually, a local guy in, in Jindabyne oh, okay. that specialises in American uh, imports, and yeah. he was the only one that could find something. It's fantastic. Monotube shock absorbers, they've got all adjustable uh, arms, canard yeah. rods. It's fantastic. A three-inch lift. He thinks he's something special now, doesn't he, Aaron, <laughs> eh? It's a good thing you can still beat him on a bike. <laughs> and there we were at Walhalla. Oh, what a nice place this is. It's another old mining town, of course, but this one's a lot more touristy, too. As a Queenslander, I've got to admit, there's nothing quite like the history of Victoria. It's got it all. And it's especially got some very historic pubs. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? The Hummer was starting to look like the brownest red truck you've ever seen. Mind you, Terry's KJ looked fairly brown too. We all looked like we'd been sort of dumped in a mud bath and rolled around a few times. But none of that matters when you hit the Walhalla Lodge. Well, this is Walhalla, and that means the end of this particular trip through the high country. But you know what? We've only just scratched the surface. This is just such a magnificent place to go four-wheel driving, a place where Mother Nature rules, and a four-wheel drive is the only way you'll get to see it. Meanwhile, I've got to race home, find some shorts and a singlet, get my thongs, get Milo, and head on up the Cape. At least it'll be warmer up there. See you there. Australia really is the greatest place on earth and I reckon the outback is the heart and soul of our country. There's nothing I love better than getting in Milo and driving off into the fast peace and quiet that you only get when you're right out in the bush. And the best thing is, it's just down the end of your street too. So come on, this is where you'll feel the true heartbeat of Australia. Come out here and have a look. <laughs>